All right. May I open court, Judge? Yes. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States in this Honorable Court. Case number 19-1041. Ms. McClellan for the petitioners, Ms. Kid Miller for the respondents. Good morning. So I gather the uh, court clerk has uh, explained to you that although Judge Garland is unable to be on the Zoom this morning, the proceedings are being fully taped. All right, Ms. McClellan, you may proceed. Good morning. My name is Kathleen McClellan on behalf of the petitioner Robin Marcato. May it please the court. The plain language of the Whistleblower Protection Act controls the result in this case. Whistleblowers are often not perfect employees. Ms. Marcato was not a perfect employee. But the question before this court is not, did Ms. Marcato commit misconduct? The question before this court, the question required by the plain language of the Whistleblower Protection Act is would the agency have taken the same action against Ms. Marcato had she not been a whistleblower? And on that question, the answer is no. The agency has used the Defense Department Inspector General investigation to mask a straightforward and retaliatory chain of events. A high level agency official, Catherine Trujillo, with a motive to retaliate against Ms. Marcato, accused Ms. Marcato of misconduct, and those accusations resulted in her termination. 18 months of investigation and a 900 page report do not change those fundamental facts. The administrative judge made two critical errors. First, he misapplied the Whistleblower Protection Act's burden shifting scheme by requiring that Ms. Marcato show retaliatory motive when the burden should have been completely on the agency. And second, he made findings not supported by the evidentiary record that the agency had clearly and convincingly proved independent causation for its tainted removal action. And for these reasons, we ask that the AJ's decision be reversed and corrective action ordered under the Whistleblower Protection Act. Ms. McClellan, on your first point, you say that the administrative judge erred because he put the burden on Ms. Marcato, but he described the burden accurately, right? He described the burden as the burden on the agency to show the clear and convincing evidence that supported the agency's action. And and he did require that the agency show that it would have taken the same action. And what you focus on in your brief is the part of the administrative judge's opinion where he discusses a subsidiary factor in the question about whether the agency would have taken the same action. And you argue that the administrative judge erred by looking to Ms. Marcato for evidence of motive. But the statute speaks only in terms of whether the agency would have taken the same action. And on that, the administrative judge was clear that the burden was and, and always was on the agency. So how is it error that he was looking to Ms. Marcato for any further evidence that would persuade him that motive was the reason? It's undisputed that Ms. Marcato proved her prima facie case and the plain language of the statute requires no further proof from Ms. Marcato. And while I agree with your honor that he was looking for evidence, he ignored substantial evidence of retaliatory motive. But I think the legislative history is instructive here because putting any, requiring any additional evidence from Ms. Marcato after she made her prima facie case is there's no support for that in the plain language of the statute. The burden shifts entirely. It's a very, you know, it's different from like a McDonnell Douglas burden shifting framework. And Congress actually wrote contributing factor into the prima facie case to overrule case law that had required whistleblowers to demonstrate retaliatory motive. Congress thought it was unrealistic to have whistleblowers have to come forward with that proof. So the so, idea- but, Yeah, but how, I'm just trying to understand how your theory works because, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like what you're saying is that once a whistleblower has prima facie evidence that 
she is a whistleblower. The, um, what is it? The time, time and, and, uh, knowledge timing. pardon? Knowledge timing test. Knowledge and timing, right. I'm part of the agency that she's, that's her prima facie case. And what, what does it look like in your view for the agency to disprove motive? Because one way of understanding the car factors is that when the agency says, look, we treat other people this way under s- similar circumstances, and we would have taken the same action in any event, given the nature of her disciplinary infractions, that that is disproving motive. I think that's not necessarily an, the entirety of the evidence that could be offered to disprove motive. No, but in this case, it might be. Couldn't it in a case be sufficient as disproof of motive? In other words, Carr is giving three factors, not every one of which has to be present, not every one of which has to be shown by the employer, proved or disproved by the employer to clear and convincing evidence. But if the bottom line, which is it would have taken the same action, is shown by clear and convincing evidence, isn't that under the statute and under Carr enough? If that were true, that would be enough, but that's very untrue in this case, because there was ample evidence of retaliatory motive. So for um, him to place the burden on Mercado to produce this evidence and then not analyze the evidence that existed amplifies how he wrongly shifted the burden because the statute doesn't say that she has to produce any evidence of retaliatory motive. The agency has to produce evidence. And I think that there is evidence of a non-retaliatory motive that could have been produced that was not. But I think significantly in this case, there was ample evidence of a motive to retaliate on the behalf of officials involved in accusing her of misconduct. And you're talking about more or less sort of a cat's paw theory where even if the people who made the ultimate determination were not very tied up in what Mercado describes as the as the retaliatory course of events, they were just putting the cherry on top of a whole series of events that was fraught with retaliation in her view, and that that's what should have been looked into more in your view or, or accounted for more in the in the AJ's decision? Well, I think it's far more direct than that because there's longstanding board precedent that when an investigation is closely linked to a personnel action, the board should look to the beginning of the investigation. And the deputy inspector general testified that without the defense department inspector general investigation, there would have been no removal. The, the deciding official in this case wasn't even at the agency at the time of the events in question. The proposing official wasn't her supervisor at the time of the events in question. They didn't witness any of the events in question. They relied entirely on this investigation. So I'm not entirely sure I follow that. When someone has a prima facie case of, of retaliation based on whistleblowing, the agency is disabled from doing any investigation? No, the agency is disabled from doing anything to the whistleblower that it would not do absent her whistleblowing. And here, the agency launched an investigation in part because of her whistleblowing. Well, no, they they launch an investigation the way they frame it is they launch an investigation into infractions. And then they thought, okay, well, we're not really going to be seen as neutral here because she has claimed retaliation for whistleblowing. So instead of doing it in-house, we have to send it to defense OIG. And if if the alternative is not no investigation, but the alternative is an in-house investigation, it's hard to see how the defense OIG investigation is itself, that that we would properly view that as retaliatory. Because there's not evidence that they would have launched this investigation into her absent her whistleblowing. The, The link between whistleblowing and personnel actions is exactly what the Whistleblower Protection Act was trying to prevent. And the post hoc justification that this was launched based on infractions is not supported by the record because the reason in the letter requesting the investigation, the reason in the report of investigation is that as she self-identified as a whistleblower. No, 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 no. I mean, if you look at the letter requesting the investigation is here's someone who has disclosed to a target 
uh, a bunch of information about the investigation. Here's someone who, when confronted about a recording, has lied to, the, as a matter of fact, that the AJ finds lied to her supervisors. And those are featured in the referral letter. So put aside, let's say the letter said nothing about the whistleblowing. Different case? Yes, if the agency could show that it would have launched the investigation without the whistleblowing. Which the it's not AJ a- found that it would have, that it would have by clear and convincing evidence, given the nature of these infractions. But and then there's whether referring to her as a as a self-described whistleblower changes everything, which I understand your theory is that it does, but you know, the the countervailing argument um, that the government has made is we should be commended, not criticized for sending it off to the defense OIG. I think that it would be commendable if the government had actually, you, if that were the real reason, but I think that was a pretextual reason because of the agency's conduct during the investigation and because of the agency's conduct after the investigation. The agency has said whistleblowing has nothing to do with it, but then the agency also sent a letter to the Council for Inspectors General for Integrity and Efficiency saying that the entire investigation was based on whistleblowing reprisal. The, you know, the fact that the agency started this investigation, it, it made accusations against Ms. Marchetto. It didn't have to start that way. They had a draft letter that characterized the entire investigation as against investigator Giacalone. They didn't send that letter. They chose to accuse Ms. Marchetto of misconduct after a long history of a motive to retaliate against her. And that motive to retaliate against her was not in the AJ's opinion. So the finding that they proved by clear and convincing evidence is not supported by the record. And finally, you know, in, this trying is- to, in trying to decide what the agency would have done but for the retaliatory motive, isn't it pretty important how serious the misconduct is? That is a factor, but simply mm-hmm. proving that the penalty of removal was reasonable for the misconduct would not be enough. But if we thought, if the IJ could reasonably think that when an official in an IG's office discloses sensitive information about a pending investigation to a target, and the IG could pretty reasonably think that that is a um, pretty significant infraction. Perhaps, but that's not, I don't think, factually what happened here. The person who Ms. Marchetto disclosed information to was not a target. She was a witness and a former employee. And the name of the target that the agency has claimed is law enforcement sensitive was not marked law enforcement sensitive and in fact appears unredacted in the proposed removal letter. So the agency has characterized it as very serious. Do you, but think, I don't think, the, do you think the DOD IG had a retaliatory motive? I think that the DOD OIG used the letter from the accusations from Mr. Hilo as the basis. Did they have a- I understand, I, I understand your theory that that investigation was caused by something that was improperly motivated and therefore we, it's fruit of a poisonous tree and we just have to ignore it. But the DOD investigators had no, aren't alleged to have had a bad motive, right? And they found that there was serious misconduct. And we can use that finding in when you run the clock backwards and ask yourself what would have happened at the beginning of this process, but for the improper motive, could take into account that a neutral party um, investigated and found that the misconduct was substantial. I don't think the fact that the Defense Department investigation was independent means that it was not pretextual and retaliatory. And that's because the motive behind the referral carries over? Yes, and 
their evidence. Of and only because the motive behind the referral carries over. I think also because of the agency's conduct during the investigation, including misrepresenting what the investigation was about and trying to avoid investigation of whistleblower retaliation. And that's once um, Congress expressed concern that Ms. Marketo was being retaliated against, the agency said, well, you know, we've referred the letter that, you know, from Mr. Lawson that accused her of retaliation. We referred that to the Council for Inspectors General and they, they said, okay, and, and then they referred it to DOD and USAID OIG omitted in, the, omitted in those communications to Congress that they had actually told Siggy that DOD OIG was investigating reprisal when that was simply never the case. And I think that that's evidence that the post hoc justifications that we see for the investigation are different from the real motive, which is right there in the uh, letter, which is that as she herself identified as a whistleblower. And so why would her whistleblowing be necessary in referring her for an outside investigation? If there's a causal link between- To explain why um, state is asking DOD to do its investigations. Right. And I don't think the plain language of the Whistleblower Protection Act allows for that because the question is, would they have taken the same action? Proving the charges and the nexus and the penalty is not enough. They have to show that they would have acted in the same way. But, but I think the question then is, is the same way doing an investigation or doing an investigation, you know, farmed out to defense OIG. And I, I guess the question is, is there any harm to her that the investigation was done by defense OIG rather than by USAID OIG? If it's the referral that is, that you're characterizing as retaliatory, it's just hard to see that any harm flows from that as distinct from saying, doing an investigation of these infractions at all and if that's the question, then you gets back to Judge Katz's point, which is in light of someone's whistleblowing, when there's also evidence of a serious breach of investigative confidentiality, the agency's hands are tied and no investigation by anybody is supposed to take place. That's, that's the difficulty. Is I think the reason that the referral to the Defense Inspector General is so significant in this case is because the agency has said that it would not have fired her, but for that investigation. That's the question. But for the results of, of an investigation into her wrongdoing, right? So I guess, Mike, let me try to get, get a better handle on your position. Um, is it your position that in sending it to defense, they should have said, you know, we have some internal potential conflicts of interest, and that's why we're sending it to you, instead of saying whistleblowing, and that would have been fine? I think that the agency, if they wanted to discipline Ms. Marcato, should have treated her the same as non-whistleblowers. Well, we get that at the high level of generality, but if they have somebody who's violating a serious, you know, investigative confidentiality policy, likely, I mean, we don't, we have reason to believe they would also have investigated that person with, without any whistleblowing. So, and then there's elsewhere you suggest that, well, what they should have done is included the whistleblowing rep reprisal issue in the referral to defense OIG. Is that your position? No, that's not. Okay. It's not that they should have included that. It's that, that their conduct in trying to exclude it demonstrates the pretextual nature. And not just exclude the whistleblowing retaliation from the defense inspector general investigation, but mischaracterizing it as uh, based on a complaint from Ms. Marcato of reprisal. I mean, that's at odds with the whole purpose. The investigation was a complaint from Trujillo about Ms. Marcato. She was the target. So for them to tell Siggy, oh, the, the defense's IG is already investigating a complaint of reprisal from Marcato. You should just forward this on over there. That is a, a manipulative way of avoiding anybody looking at the retaliation issue. They cannot, I think, you know, if the, if the, if the, con, if the charge was looking so retaliatory, or if the conduct was looking so retaliatory and so potentially retaliatory that they had to refer it to an outside investigation to give it sort of the veneer of legitimacy. I think that's exactly 
what the plain language of the statute is trying to prevent, that whistleblowing is in one lane and personnel actions are in the other. And if they stay that way, then agencies should be able to clearly and convincingly demonstrate that and, and here they did not stay that way, they're linked. And that's why um, the agency, uh, the AJ's decision is unsupported by the evidence. I see that my time has expired, but I'm happy. We'll, we'll give you a couple minutes for, for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Kim Miller. You may proceed. Good morning. May it please the court. I'd like to start at the same place that Ms. Mercado began, and that is with the plain language of the statute. Um, under 5 U.S.C. 1221 E2, corrective action cannot be ordered if there's a finding, if the agency demonstrates by clear and convincing evidence that it would have taken the same personnel action, here removal, in the absence of such disclosure. The administrative judge found that here, and that finding is supported by substantial evidence. Ms. Mercado's theory depends on the idea that um, not, not only uh, Mr. Ross, the initial supervisor, but also DOD, OIG, and then later the proposing and deciding officials who she herself describes as not even having been involved in the original um, disclosures or misconduct, that all of them were somehow influenced by others who may have had a retaliatory intent. This isn't just a cat's paw theory, it's more like a whole litter of cats where each has its paw on the next one in the chain. The administrative judge uh, fully considered motive of uh, the different officials involved in the removal decision at pages 724 and 725 of his decision. And uh, the DOD Office of Inspector General portion is extremely important in this case. The administrative judge found, uh, and I quote, no information in the record and no evidence in the record of animus or any retaliatory motive on the part of DOD. Ms. Kid Miller, the, the, the AJ doesn't deal with what seems like potentially the most arguably potent evidence of retaliation, which was by acting uh, oh, uh, Inspector General Mike Carroll back in, in 2012, he was, he was angry, he raised his voice, he was yelling about Mercado after she made some audit recommendations and Ross testifies to that effect. I think Deborah Scott uh, maybe also testifies about that. They were present at that meeting. They're the ultimate people acting on this. And you know, it was, it was sometime before, but my understanding is that Mercado's theory is that you know, this kind of reaction to her whistleblowing was really what put her in the doghouse, just to mix some pet metaphors here, <laughs> cat's paw in the doghouse. Um, and, and that it's somewhat, you know, in, in Mercado's view, it's problematic that he, that the AJ did not assess the evidence of retaliation stemming from the acting IG that, that was known, the displeasure was, that was expressed was known to these deciding officials. Um, Your Honor, first one point of clarification, which, which I think is clear, but I do just wanna clarify. We, we do have um, two Mr. Carroll yes, in the record. Right. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that's clear that the deciding official who was a Jason Carroll is different than right. Michael Carroll. Um, there's also I misspoke. It's Deborah, Deborah Scott, who I think <laughs> Deborah Scott was present, but but the later yes, hired yes. Carol, no relation Carol, wasn't present. Thank you. No, you're right. Yes, Your Honor. I I I I believe that you were clear on that from from the question. I just wanted to. I myself was confused about that when I first got the case. So, um, I think the important point here is that Michael Carroll. Um, had left the agency before the misconduct that was at issue in this case. In fact, it was the later inspector general, Ms. Carr, was the person who ultimately made the decision to refer to the Department of Defense OIG for investigation. Right, so and Marcato's view, sorry to interrupt, just to sort of uh, feed into that, Marcato's view is Trujillo was very much a protege of the first Mr. Carroll, and she remains in the agency and she remains a mover behind the discipline. 
uh, that ends up resulting in the firing, which is why I use the, the cat's paw formulation because you know, I think Mercado's stronger case is, sure, you know, Car, uh, Carol the first wasn't the one who pulled the trigger, but he worked closely with Trujillo. She helped to build the record and react and respond to the, uh, to the infractions. And so there is a really pretty clear path from retaliation to discharge. And the AJ doesn't really address that. The AJ is more formalistic saying, you know, we have these two officials, they're recently arrived. We have a determination by defense, OIG, and that's not tainted by the retaliation. Well, although the administrative judge doesn't explicitly discuss Ms. Trujillo in that motive section of his opinion, he does explicitly discuss Mr. Carroll, who was the deciding official. And um, the, the record, the evidence presented to the administrative judge demonstrated that uh, Ms. Trujillo had retired some nine months before the decision to remove Ms. Mercado. Now, as Ms. Mercado points out, Ms. Trujillo was still working as a reemployed uh, annuitant at the time. Um, but she, the, the, the record showed that she was uh, at her home working from Texas, and she was working in the audit division. Uh, this is all explained in a uh, declaration that Ms. Trujillo submitted to the administrative judge at page 369 of the record. So she, was in a, she wasn't in the management department anymore, which is where Mr. Carroll and Ms. Marcato worked. She was in a different department, different geographic location, working part-time on much lower level projects as the need arose. So um, in, the, in the context of all of that evidence that these, the, the people whom Ms. Marcato accused of having motive to retaliate had by and large all left the agency. And if you look at page 725 of the administrative judge's decision, he focuses on some testimony from Ms. Marcato. Um, and although he broadly cites just testimony of the appellant, I, I think the corresponding site here is pages 631 and 632 of the record. And in that part of her testimony, Ms. Marcato was explaining that she didn't, even she did not believe that Ms. Scott and Mr. Carroll, the deciding official, were themselves motiv motivated to retaliate against her. Rather, she thought they were, quote, influenced by this senior management who was at that point largely gone from the agency. And the administrative judge explicitly found Mr. Carroll's credibility on this issue to outweigh the appellants whose answers appear to have been speculative. So uh, you know, could, could the administrative judge have perhaps written us something more fulsome here and said it more explicitly? Sure, but the Court of Appeals does not review the, 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 the writing of the administrative judge. The, the point is to make sure that he did the correct analysis. And this analysis on page 75 um, shows that he did fully consider the motive evidence and focused appropriately on that deciding official who made the decision that is also the focus of the plain language of the statute, the removal. Well, let's I, talk for, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Judge Cassis. Oh, sorry. Uh, can I ask about a different aspect of the judge's reasoning, which is it seems a little bit internally inconsistent to the extent that when he was assessing the prima facie case, he said there's some circumstantial evidence of retaliation under this, what is it, time you know, knowledge. Time knowledge test. And then when he when he comes to the defense and asks himself whether the agency would have made the same decision, and obviously those questions are related. He's looking at the extent of the misconduct against the extent of the retaliation. At that point, he says the appellant failed to show the agency's actions were motivated by retaliation. It seems like those two statements are inconsistent. If the second one were true, there would be no prima facie case in the first place. How do we reconcile those? 
Well, there's, there's no inconsistency there at all. The, um, under the, the prima facie case and the knowledge timing test, um, and this is discussed at page 721 of the administrative judge's decision, the point is, um, as the test implies, is purely the knowledge that Ms. Marcato had made whistleblower disclosure. So at page 721, we see the administrative judge referencing the fact that Mr. Carroll learned about some several of Ms. Marcato's disclosures, that Ms. Scott had actual knowledge of the appellant's whistleblower disclosures, and of course the DOD OIG investigation acknowledged that she was a whistleblower. Right, but, but it's that but it's not knowledge for its own sake. It's knowledge as evidence that the decision, at least in part, was motivated by a bad motive. I, I disagree that the that the contributing factor element um, ha has anything to do with motive. It's that the um, decision makers acknowledge. Sorry, should, I'm right. using it's, motive as shorthand for a retaliatory intent. Well, and I, I, I'm not trying to make a, 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 a wording point, but a broader point that um, that that making the prima facie case of a contributing factor is a relatively low bar. Mm -hmm. And in this case, where Ms. Marcato herself would often inform her supervisors that she considered herself to be a whistleblower, um, they knew of that status. I, I, I understand that. And it would be perfectly, in my view, it would be perfectly reasonable on this record for the judge to have said, there's some, there's some evidence, there's enough to clear the relatively low bar of the prima facie case. And then I have to assess the defense with the agency have done the same thing. And there's substantial evidence of serious misconduct and the retaliatory evidence is relatively attenuated and circumstantial. And therefore I find by clear and convincing evidence they would have done the same thing. But he didn't quite say that. He said there was no evidence at the defense stage. He said there was, she failed to prove um, Failed to prove the agency's actions were motivated by retaliation. Well, um, so that that the administrative judge made that statement specifically with re, um, uh, uh, regarding the second um, car factor, mm -hmm. but er, before launching into those car factors, and I just as a, a quick point of background here, the um, the Federal Circuit. Uh, and several other circuits at this point have now adopted these same car factors. Um, th this court described those car factors in a 2005 decision, Kozola, um, as a gloss on the statutory requirements of 1221. So it's not necessary that the agency even present evidence on all three car factors, but they are a helpful tool for the court to, the administrative judge and, and this court in turn to analyze um, whether the agency would have taken the same action. So the, the administrative judge very clearly found uh, before analyzing the individual factors that the agency showed by clear and convincing evidence it would have removed during the absence of disclosure and made that same finding again at the end of his analysis. Now, while he does refer to the, uh, um, the appellant's uh, failing to show retaliatory motive, I, I think that um, that's more language reacting to the reality of how evidence of retaliatory motive typically comes into the record. The agency is trying to prove a negative. No, I, understand. Agency... I, I understand. And you're sort of answering the, the burden shifting point, but I'm not sure. I guess I'm just not sure it's internally consistent, but. So, so on the burden shifting point, um, you know, your brief says that the AJ's reference to Mercado's failure to prove retaliatory motive is, quote, stray language, close quote. And that was page 21 of your brief. But, you know, if you look at the section on retaliatory motive in the, in the opinion, the heading in bold says the appellant has failed to show retaliatory motive. And the first sentence says the appellant 
has failed to show the agency's actions were motivated by retaliation. So it's, it's hard to characterize as stray language. <clears throat> and some of what I hear you say today is a little bit different from brushing it off as stray language. And I guess I'd like to hear more about your view. Is it that, I mean, to some extent, it seems like the other car factors are speaking directly to the retaliatory motive question as well. And if you see it that way, then in showing what it would have done anyway, and in showing how it treated other similarly situated people, the agency is showing a lack of retaliatory motive. Is that your theory? Um, well, I, I do think it's true that there can be overlap between the car factors, particularly one and two, the strength of the agency's action. This was very um, serious misconduct, uh, especially um, lying under oath, for example, to another uh, investigator from another office of inspector general. The, um, the administrative judge's language here ha has to be read in context, of course. And in context, I, I think it's more of a, a reaction to the strength of the agency's evidence that it took its action for proper motives, and also a reaction to the absence of evidence in the record that there was a retaliatory motive, particularly on the part of deciding uh, official Mr. Carroll. Um, it, it's very interesting to note that in um, Whitmore, which is one of the leading federal circuit cases on the car factors, and it's very clear that the burden is clear and convincing evidence for the agency. The Federal Circuit even has a line at page 1372 of its opinion where it says federal employees are entitled to rely on circumstantial evidence to prove a motive to retaliate. So there the, the Federal Circuit was quite clear the burden is on the agency, but we see even the Federal Circuit using the same kind of language that the administrative judge uses here. And I think it's just a reflection of the reality that the agency can put on its evidence uh, for proper motive, which the administrative judge analyzes here, but it's um, typically circumstantial evidence that comes from the appellant that if a motive, an improper motive, really is what uh, motivated the agency, it's, it's typically as a reality coming from the appellant. And I, and I think this so is probably I'm, a reaction. I, I, I have to say, I'm sorry, but you somewhat confused me. Let me just ask you one simple question. Is it your position that the burden is on the agency to show each of the car factors by clear and convincing evidence? No. The burden is on the agency to show by clear and convincing evidence that it would have removed Ms. Marcato even in the absence of her whistleblower disclosures. The car factors are a tool to help analyze that, um, but according to Federal Circuit case law, for example, the agency is not even required to offer evidence as to each of the three car factors. So it's not that the agency has to prove every car factor by clear and convincing evidence. The touchstone is always that question that comes from the statute, whether the agency showed it would have removed Ms. Mercado anyway. So if Ms. Mercado or a, a plaintiff comes forward with evidence of retaliatory motive, and the agency doesn't rebut that evidence directly at all, but powerfully shows that it has other grounds that are strong for firing the person. It might still succeed in establishing that it would have taken the action anyway. Yes, Your Honor. And so in this case, if, 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 if um, Marcato had had, instead of an, the inference arising out of timing and knowledge, had had direct evidence of someone saying, you know, sh we can't have her here. She's, you know, the whistleblowing is distracting us from our mission. And the agency left that on the table, but showed that she seriously violated rules and that 
her discharge was similar to discharges of other people who had seriously violated rules, that that could succeed in your view under the statute and under Carr? I, I think it would depend on who was giving that testimony. So if hypothetically the deciding official here, Mr. Carroll, had made statements that he felt very influenced and pressured to retaliate in his decision, which is the precise opposite of what he testified. But if that had been um, the testimony, then I think that that would have been a much stronger case for Ms. Marcato. We would have expected to see the administrative judge engaging with and analyzing that evidence in the opinion. Judge Katzis, any also. further? Thank you, Ms. Kidmiller. All right, yeah. well, uh, I don't, I think we used up all your time on, on uh, your opening, but uh, as I said, Ms. McClellan, you can have uh, up to two minutes. You need not take it all, but for your rebuttal. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to point out um, the discussion of the low burden for Ms. Marcato. That was an intentionally low burden Congress put in and the agency's burden is high. And for a matter to be proven clearly and convincingly, the administrative judge was supposed to weigh the countervailing evidence. That did not happen here. It wasn't simply Ms. Marcato's testimony. The whistleblower ombudsman from the agency described a culture of retaliation, described a history of retaliation against Ms. Marcato, described that he was pressured to change opinions that he had written against disciplining Ms. Marcato in the past. And so, um, and that is likewise with Mr. Ross, who's the supervisor. The AJ writes it as though Mr. Ross, um, you know, initiated this action when in fact he testified that he was pressured by Ms. Trujillo, that he felt he was, she was unduly pressuring him, that he felt she had a retaliatory motive and that he himself was retaliated against for not going along with it. That evidence appears nowhere in the AJ's decision. So to find a matter clearly and convincingly proven without weighing that evidence, that's a finding not supported by the record. Wasn't Ross also though that the one of the recipients of Ms. Marcato's false statements and he, he does support the agency that in fact <clears throat> she lied directly to Trujillo and to Ross? I don't view the false statements charge as clear cut. In that way, I think that Mr. Ross's testimony is is mixed. I think he says, I didn't, I don't remember saying that to the defense IG, that he would believe Ms. Marcato over Ms. Trujillo. But I think that what's significant then is that the question is no longer, can the agency prove that it could have removed Ms. Marcato for this misconduct? That's not enough. That's that it would have. That it would have. That's yeah. that's the standard. And and proving that it would have. I think in this case, because it's based on this defense inspector general investigation includes proving that it would have undertaken this investigation. And none of that, why the investigation was undertaken, that discussion that we had today appears in the AJ's analysis. So in order to rule for you, do we have to find that in the absence of, or do we have to find that the, the AJ erred in failing to account for a reality supported in the record that in the absence of a retaliatory motive, even in the face of these infractions, the agency would not have investigated? No, not exactly. And, and certainly not as a bright line rule. I think it's a fact dependent question. When you have the deputy inspector general saying we would not have fired her if this had not been substantiated by the Department of Defense Inspector General, then in that, by an investigation. See, that's the. I don't, you know, Your Honor, I think he says, had there been no substantiated findings out of the Defense Inspector General investigation, that's because the, that's who did it. But but if, but if you accept that it was it was a matter of course that somebody would have investigated it, then the fact the, the fact that it may have hinged on her self-identification as a whistleblower that it went to defense doesn't, it's just, it feels like it carries more than, it, it, it bears more weight than it can to say that that referral was somehow retaliatory because it referenced whistleblowing and therefore what we should compare it to is a no investigation 
baseline as opposed to an in-house investigation baseline or an investigation by them that said, mentioned some generic conflict of interest rather than whistleblowing? Well, I think it hinges on the agency has not shown that it would have taken the defense inspector general without. It's the agency's burden to show that they would have done this. Yeah. And there's a dearth of evidence that the agency's justifications aren't supported by the written record. And so it's not so much that you have to find that, um, that they're not allowed to investigate, certainly not, but there's no evidence of what was what needed to be proved. Ms. Marcato submitted the email, they had it. They said it was self-evident. There's no evidence of why her whistleblowing is even a relevant inclusion in, in a letter accusing her of misconduct. And I think that, that those facts evince the pretextual nature. And then combined with the a AJ's failure to reckon with them. Dr. Katsas, do you have any more questions? No, sir. All right. Thank you both very much. The case is submitted. Case number 207020, Christopher Chandler, the appellant versus Donna Berlin et al. Mr. Oliveri for the appellants, Ms. Dean for the appellees. Good morning, uh, Mr. Oliveri, you may proceed. Good morning, your honors, and may it please the court. My name is Joe Oliveri and I represent the plaintiff appellant, Christopher Chandler in this case. Your Honors, at the most basic level, this appeal arises from the district court's improper weighing of evidence on summary judgment that denied Mr. Chandler his day in court to rebut false, defamatory, and highly damaging accusations made against him. In this case, Mr. Chandler asserts two separate defamation claims, each based on a distinct publication of a dossier which defendants authored and published to journalist and prolific author Robert Erringer, who's a third party to this case, that falsely accused Mr. Chandler of, among other things, engagement in organized crime and espionage. The appeal presents a simple and straightforward question with regard to each of those two claims. Mr. Chandler's first claim arises from the 2017 republication by Mr. Erringer to the British media of the dossier that defendants authored and previously published only to him. The question before this court is whether the district court erred in granting summary judgment based on its holding as a matter of law that it was not reasonably foreseeable to defendants that Mr. Erringer, who paid defendants to author and publish this defamatory dossier about Mr. Chandler, who essentially hired defendants to produce an opposition research report on Mr. Chandler, might subsequently share the allegations or repeat the allegations in that dossier. <laughs> the court absolutely erred in that holding, both because it fundamentally misconstrued the law governing the foreseeability analysis, and also separately because it failed to consider and to credit on summary judgment evidence that courts have repeatedly held make republication of a libel reasonably foreseeable. Mr. Chandler's second claim arises- Wait, you, you mentioned evidence that other courts have credited and what evidence are you talking about in, <laughs> sure, that's you're, relevant you're, here? Yes, Your Honor. So the district court in its, in its uh, opinion did not consider the fact that Mr. Uh, that Mr. Chandler, or I'm sorry, that defendants here published their dossier to Mr. Erringer, who is a journalist. And now you it, talk about evidence, but you never, I don't know if you represented uh, Mr. Chandler in, in the trial court, but, but there was no deposition of Mr. Berlin to pin down actually what he did know. Is that right? That, that's right, Your Honor. The court, the court grant, granted only li very limited discovery with regard to the second claim here uh, about whether or not um, the discovery rule applied. But here, despite the lack of a, of a deposition of Mr. Berlin, uh, there's still evidence in the record that, um, and let me go through a couple of things. First, that Mr. Erringer was a journalist and courts have, have commonsensically recognized and defendants don't dispute that it's reasonably foreseeable 
foreseeable that a ju- that a journalist may republish defamatory statements that are made to them. And the only <laughs> way we know we're imputing knowledge to Mr. Berlin about Mr. Erlen Erlinger's status as a journalist based on matters of public record because you never sought a Rule 56D opportunity to depose Mr. Berlin, right? It, it's correct that we have not, that Mr. Chandler Blow did not seek uh, to depose Mr. Berlin, but there is still evidence both in the public record and also uh, if you look at the statements of material facts submitted in conjunction with the summary judgment motion, in Mr. Chandler's counter statement of material facts, uh, he stated that Mr. Berlin and defendants did in fact know these know that Mr. Erringer was a journalist uh, and defendants never objected to or, or disputed that fact on summary judgment. In addition, and tying directly into that, Your Honor, uh, the record shows that defendants here have decades of experience in the research and investigation industry, and they know that their clients uh, seek information from them to use that information. Defendants brag on their website, which again is, is in the summary judgment record, that their clients engage their services to obtain information in order to use it, whether it's through uh, the performance of due diligence, compliance activities, and to pursue litigation. And it's reasonably foreseeable that clients using that information would necessarily necessarily share it. Clients don't pay uh, Mr. Berlin to produce reports uh, just to get information to put it in a lockbox and seal it away. So that sounds like you think your claim suffices simply by Mr. Erlinger having shared the information with the prince. Why isn't that the beginning and end of your claim? Well, I, I think that's exactly right as well that there's the republication to the prince as well um in addition to a republication uh to the british media years later uh, the fact the fact of the matter is that under the reasonably foreseeability analysis uh defendants need not have foreseen the precise injury uh that ultimately happens to the plaintiff or the particular method in which that harm occurs, as long as it was reasonably foreseeable that the allegations would be republished to somebody. And here, the record shows that defendants did have knowledge, or at least there was a fact question as to whether defendants had that knowledge or should have had that knowledge that uh, the allegations in the dossier may be republished. Um, if you look also, defendants submitted a declaration in this case in which they stated that they told Mr. Erringer he needed to verify the information in the dossier before relying on that. And from that as well, it's reasonable to conclude that defendants were expressly contemplating that Mr. Erringer may share the information. That, in- that seems like a stretch. I mean, they could, without <laughs> tipping their hand about what they already had, they could take action to verify the, that information as a set of hypotheses without, without actually sharing the dossier. But just going back to the cases that you rely on, I have a, a few questions. It's striking how long the time is here between Berlin giving the dossier to Erringer and the British press getting it. Do you have any cases that support that long time lapse. I think your only case is, is the Cosby case, which is, is there anything else that supports a, a long time lag like that? Sure. Two, two points, Your Honor. Just very quickly, the first thing you mentioned about whether Herringer could uh, could uh, verify the information without sharing it, that's absolutely true. It's a fact question that was resolved on summary judgment here. More directly to your recent, to your uh, more recent question there, with regard to the timing I want to first emphasize uh, that the key question here is whether it was foreseeable to the defendants that the libel might be republished. Uh, Foreseeability is measured at the time of the defendant's wrongdoing, not in hindsight. The district court here, as Your Honor recognized in her question, said that the most important reason for holding republication unforeseeable was that passage of 14 years. But future events cannot make foreseeability at an earlier date any more or less likely. (laughs) To your honor's subsidiary question about the case law, there's the Green v. Cosby case, which found republication foreseeable after about nine or 10 years. And I also um, (laughs) 
point to uh, somewhat relatedly in Fitzgerald, which was a defamation adjacent case, um, there was a, a much uh, claim was brought many years later. Here, however, again, the key fact with regard to the timing is that we have to assess reasonable foreseeability at the time that defendants originally published uh, the dossier. True enough, but but I don't, or accepting that as, as the case, um, it nonetheless is a question that bears on the objective reasonableness of foreseeability, whether someone in Mr. Berlin's position would forecast that this information would be shared so far in the future. It seems the further you get out, the more tenuous the objectively reasonable foreseeability becomes. So, and the, the, is that not correct? So the, the, the length of time is, is a factor, even under your view that we assess from the time of the original transaction. Respectfully, no, Your Honor. In this case, I, I would submit that that's precisely the type of hindsight analysis that courts have eschewed. Had, mis, had Mr. The, the converse applies as well. Had Mr. Erringer supplied, um, had Mr. Erringer uh, republished the uh, the dossier for the allegations in the dossier six months later, that using that as an indicator of foreseeability and still engaging in a hindsight analysis, what we have to look at is the totality of the facts uh, at the time of publication. Right. We, the sensational nature of the allegations. We have the facts that defendants know that their clients often reuse or republish uh, their work that they get from them. And we have Mr. Erringer's status as, as a journalist. These are all factors. Well, but you, you point to Mr. Erringer's status as a journalist, but is it, I don't believe it's disputed in the record that he went to ICI to get this information at this time because he wanted to get work with the Prince of Monaco, not as a journalist. And in fact, quite the contrary, as an intelligence consultant. And in that role, in that role, it would seem that it's very unlikely that Mr. Erringer would want to broadly publish the information. He would want to keep it on close hold and use it to impress the prince that he had access to, to further information that would be useful to the prince. So, and, and, and this is sort of where I think the, the projected time frame comes in to the picture. Because if Mr. Berlin is thinking, here's a guy who wants to be a confidential intelligence advisor to the prince, he, he, it's, it's not only not in his interest to republish this broadly, it's in his interest not to. Well, I think the answer to that, Your Honor, is that Mr. Erringer is wearing a couple of hats here. He, he may be wearing the, intellig the intelligence or wannabe intelligence operative hat. He's also a, a known journalist who was recently profiled by Salon Magazine just before the, uh, he contracted the defendants to get this dossier. We can't assume for purposes of summary judgment here that he's taking his journalist hat off and putting it in his pocket. Uh, for purposes of this transaction. There's no evidence of that. And of course, on summary judgment- it's but, there, but summary judgment is an evidentiary standard and, and your client also has a burden on that. There's no evidence that Berlin did know about Erringer's other hat. Well, respectfully, he does. There is evidence that, that Mr. Berlin knew about Erringer's journalism hat here. Uh, again, I would point your honor in the record to plaintiff's counter statement of material facts that was undisputed by defendants. And it's also, we would submit, reasonable to conclude that even absent that statement of that stated fact that was not disputed on summary judgment, defendants, based on their knowledge and their experience in the research and investigation industry, surely who would have would have looked into Mr. Erringer before hire, before taking him on as a client to make sure that as defendants say on their website, uh, their services are contracted for permissible purposes under law. I wanna pivot, I'm happy to answer more questions on that, but because my time's very short, I also wanna briefly address the second claim here. Well, can, let me, can I ask you, we'll-, we'll Absolutely. Time. So can I just ask a different 
um, take a different angle on your 2017 theory. Sure. Which is you don't allege that Berlin, the defendant here, did anything wrong in 2017, correct? In, in, with regard to the republication, no. His so, right. So your theory, um, th this theory we're talking about mm -hmm. has to be linked back to 2000, the 2003 publication. And your theory has to be that the, the conduct that um, Berlin engaged in in 2003 approximately caused all of these damages in 2017, because notwithstanding the passage of all of these years, the republication was reasonably foreseeable. That, that's right, Your Honor. And to the point about the 14 years, uh, right. I'm sorry, but but that only works that that only works if you if you're right on the the point that you were about to come to, which is that the the claim based on 2003 conduct didn't never accrued never accrued over all those years because the discovery rule prevented it. That's true, and I want to make sure we're not conflating the claims. That's Mr. Mr. Chandler's second claim. To your point about the passage of time, Your Honor, we submit that because DC law under the uh, says that the foreseeability analysis, uh, you do not have to foresee the precise injury or manner, as long as it was foreseeable to defendants that Erringer might republish his dossier, whether it happened one, five, 10, or 14 late years later, doesn't make a difference. And if you're using that to make a difference, you're engaging in a hindsight analysis that courts say is improper. But looking not in hindsight, I just want to probe a little bit more. You rely very heavily on these reporter source cases. Yep. And, you know, the relationship between Erringer and Berlin was not that of a reporter and a source. Um, so how can we even rely on those cases, given that what matters is what would be objectively reasonable for a person in Berlin's circumstance, mm -hmm. knowing what he knew at the time in 2003? So, so probing that, Your Honor, uh, what is what is the factual question here? You know, is it reasonable that he might have foreseen Erringer would republish this. He he knew that Erringer was a journalist who still, you know, again, it, it I would submit it would be unreasonable to expect that a known journalist and prolific author would suddenly take off his journalist hat. Yes, he is. Uh, he engaged uh, defendants to get this information, whether it's, you know, as as a source or as a paid source of information, Mr. Erringer need not, or, I'm sorry, defendants need not know what, to what end he was being engaged. Uh, they were being engaged to provide this information, just that they know that that this guy, Erringer, you know, is, look, is looking for dirt, is uh, known to be a journalist, uh, is getting sensational allegations here. There is I would submit at least a fact question here, whether it was reasonably foreseeable that he may republish this, these allegations in the future. Uh, the district court held that no reasonable juror could find it reasonably foreseeable. And that's where we submit there's error. Ultimately, at the end of the day, <laughs> Mr. Chandler may, may win or may lose, but it's not an issue that should have been decided here on summary judgment based on the mix of evidence in the record. How is it whether, is it your position that all Chandler needs to prove is that some future republication is foreseeable, not this time, place, manner? Yes. What's your best authority for that broader standard that, it, that, that the foreseeability could be pretty pretty wide open. I'm putting this false information out in the world. I lack assurances that it's never going to leak out and harm this person. And therefore, it's a, it's a ticking time bomb forever. Is that the position? Well, 
I think you have to look at the confluence of facts here. In terms of case law, I would direct your honors to DC v. Perez, uh, the DC Court of Appeals, 1997, Psychiatric Institute of Washington, uh, also the DC Court of Appeals, which cited this court's decision in Kendall from some years earlier. Um, that, that governs the foreseeability analysis here. With regard to your honors ticking time bomb scenario, I think you have to look at the facts. So this isn't a case where a defendant told, uh, say, an employee, someone in his employee, some information where it would be very reasonable to expect that a confidence would be kept. Here, you're providing information to a third party uh, you know who you know is a journalist. You know that you're providing explosive allegations that people have a tendency to repeat. And you know that you are being hired and paid to provide essentially oppo research on Mr. Chandler. And people, people pay money to get information like that to use it to share it. And it's reasonable that based on all the totality of the facts here that Mr. That Mr. Uh, Berlin could have foreseen reasonably that at some point this information may have been republished. Now your cases, your, your DC versus Perez and your Psychiatric Institute of Washington cases, those are not defamation or libel cases. Those are other kinds of tort cases. Do you, do you I mean, I, I don't know whether it's because of the First Amendment overtones, but it doesn't seem that the courts have, have been as generous with foreseeability where we're talking about information. Well, Your Honor, I think there's there's a lack of case law out there because the facts here are admittedly pretty unique. It's not, not every day that someone hires a private investigator to uh, provide, to get sensational allegations and then sits on it for a period of time like they did here. Um, Admittedly, there's not a lot of case law there, but the principles from Perez and Psychiatric Institute, the principles governing the foreseeability analysis apply in full force. And the cause- And, and Mr. Berlin argues, sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Okay. Berlin argues that, uh, you know, allegations in defamation cases are always explosive. So on your framing, the there would always be foreseeability. You basically- cause is there once the information is is set loose. I, I want to make it, make it clear there. So defamatory statements, as, as Mr. Berlin explains in his brief, are always discreditable statements. They're always statements that are going to hurt someone in their reputation. That said, there are degrees there, and there is a huge difference between explosive allegations of, of Russian espionage of organized crime and massive money laundering schemes versus the statement that John Smith stole an apple from his teacher. So all of those are discreditable statements, but certainly the allegations of espionage that are also newsworthy explosive allegations are of a different order of magnitude than those other discreditable statements. So the, the exception doesn't swallow the rule here. I'm also, we haven't really talked about the tolling issue that much right. separately, but on the one hand, you're willing to attribute a lot of information that was public to Mr. Berlin, but mm -hmm. it seems less so when it comes to imputing knowledge to put Mr. Chandler on inquiry notice. Why, why isn't it the case as the district court held that Erringer's various republications, 2009, 15, 16, were enough to cause a re reasonably diligent target of these, as you say, defamatory and, and extraordinary statements to make inquiry and find out sure. what their You're punitive source was. Your, Your Honor's question presents two two related issues. One, the inquiry notice uh, point. You know whether whether the uh, 2009 lawsuit or 2014 book put Mr. Chandler on inquiry notice, and then if he were on inquiry notice, whether through the exercise of reasonable diligence he would have discovered uh, defendant's publication of the dossier. Taking those in turn, Your Honor, if we look at the 2009 lawsuit, the district court said 
and defendants, the only reason they argued that put Mr. Mr. Chandler on inquiry notice is because it said that Erringer investigated Mr. Chandler and has documents on that matter. So the complaint itself does not mention defendants, doesn't mention the dossier, doesn't mention Erringer working with anyone at all. And in fact, Erringer claims complete credit for that uh, investigation of Mr. Chandler. He says Erringer um, intensively investigated it. There's no reason to suspect that even if Mr. Erringer has documents, they would reveal defendant's dossier or defendant. How, how about the later ones where Chandler is on record sort of taking a pass? Like, I'm going to just weather these. I'm not going to find out more. These are these are foolish. Yeah, and th that that goes to the book and the blog post, which again, don't mention defendants, don't mention the dossier. Mr. Erringer, or I'm sorry, Mr. Chandler, perhaps could have de decided to sue Mr. Erringer there. However, he chose not to, which is his right. And as this court recognized in its Liberty Lobby decision, Mr. Erringer previously has been a source of scurrilous allegations. So it may, have been, may well have been Mr. Chandler decided not to sue Mr. Erringer because he didn't want to lend credibility uh, to Mr. Erringer's outlandish um, claims. I'm not sure uh, whether it makes a difference legally, but I'm just curious why that changes in 2017. If Erringer is still the source of the information that's going to the MPs and to the British press, it, why does it seem more, wh why would Mr. Chandler change his mind then? I, so I, I don't I don't think legally it makes a difference, and I hesitate to to speculate on on the record here, Your Honors. But I think it would be reasonable that come 2017, when Miss when Mr. Erringer republishes this dossier or the allegations in the dossier to the British media, and it creates a firestorm where British Parliament was investigating Mr. Chandler. They ultimately found he was an innocent man, of course. But at that point, um, it wasn't just some some book self-published on Mr. Erringer's website. It was allegations that, false allegations that are gaining traction and it compelled Mr. Chandler to step up at that point. I also, I don't wanna leave unanswered your honor's second question um, about about the reasonable diligence. If he were on inquiry notice, which again, I don't think and I would submit that the lawsuit and the book do not put Mr. Chandler on inquiry notice, but even if it did, the court's only holding on this point in defendant's argument was that if Mr. Chandler had sued Mr. Erringer, he would have discovered the dossier. There's two faults with that. First, that the district court's holding goes against settled law saying that reasonable diligence does not require a person to commence a lawsuit in order to procure discovery of unknown facts. Uh, defendants don't dispute any of that. Uh, and I think the one case that defendants cite is holding otherwise, the Bryn case says that with some evidence of wrongdoing, so i.e. the defendant already knows his his cause of action and you're in a Chappelle situation which is unlike that here uh, secondly though even if Mr. Chandler had sued Mr. Erringer there's no guarantee that he would have obtained discovery and that discovery that that discovery would have uh, shown defendants connection to the dossier he would have had to have overcome a motion to dismiss he would have Erringer would have actually had to have participated in the lawsuit and um, Erringer would have still needed to have docs linking the defendants. That's all speculative, as defendants point out in their brief. And I think that's that's exactly the point. We just don't know. And the court held as a matter of law that Mr. Chandler would have found all of those facts. Uh, I know my time has expired. I don't want to belabor uh, the point and take up the court's time. Happy to answer any other questions that your honors would have, though. Judge Cassis? That's okay. All right, even though we've consumed your time with questions, we will give you two minutes for Thank rebuttal you. after Mr. Dean has had an opportunity to argue. Good morning, Mr. Dean. You may proceed when ready. Oh, you're muted still, Mr. Dean. I'm sorry. That was, that was my best argument, too. Uh, may, may it please the court. Uh, John Dean representing uh, Mr. Berlin and the ICI companies. Uh, I want to provide a minute of context to the, um, uh, to the allegations that have been made uh, against Mr. Berlin. I'd like the court to consider Mr. Chandler's position in 2018 
when he finally gets his hands on the documents that the press has been writing about. He gets those documents and he knows Erringer is the author of one of those documents. Erringer is the person who gave those documents to the press. He knows that Erringer has been saying this stuff about him for years, starting all the way back in 2009. Because Erringer gave those documents to somebody in Great Britain, it's likely that he can sue Erringer in Great Britain, where the defamation laws are a lot more favorable uh, to plaintiffs than they are in the U.S. And what does he do? He doesn't take any action against Erringer. Instead, he embarks on what uh, plaintiff's reply brief calls an extraordinary effort to discover the author of another document. He learns that Mr. Berlin is the author. Mr. Berlin, a small businessman who delivered a report to Erringer in 2003, gave that report to nobody else. And in fact, nobody else ever got a copy of that report until 2017, according to paragraph 11 of the complaint. The prince never got it. Nobody got it, according to Mr. Uh, um, Chandler's complaint. And Mr. Berlin has made no public comments uh, about Mr. Chandler, whatever. Mr. Chandler, however, chooses Mr. Berlin as his target to combat this firestorm that, uh, that now has um, erupted. And he's got to sue Mr. Berlin in the US where the law is a lot less favorable. I, I submit, Your Honors, that these are not the actions of a wrong philanthropist who's seeking a full and fair day in court to restore his reputation which has been sullied over and over and over again by Erringer, I think it is more likely an effort to try and extract a, a concession from Mr. Berlin and in the hope that he can use that in his public relations campaign. Well, to, to be support. sure, I mean, we have to assume because the merits have yet to be litigated that Mr. Berlin has proffered false information and you know you may not accept that, but you have to provisionally accept that in the current posture. So if Mr. Berlin has has been the engine behind Mr. Erlinger's Mr. Erringer's subsequent um, dining out on the information, if it's the mm -hmm. source is Mr. Berlin, then the question is, why does the passage of time matter? If somebody told somebody else in you know, 1965, that my great grandfather was a Nazi and it didn't come out until I was, you know, nominated to be a judge, but then it becomes something all over the news. Why would it matter that there was a long passage of time if that information was false when, when communicated and because of its character and the circumstances of its having been generated made it objectively foreseeable that it would see the light of day and it would be very damaging to the reputation of its target at a later time. Why well, does I, that matter? Uh, I think it, it, it matters in this respect. And obviously, Your Honor, uh, we completely agree that for purposes of the motions we made, we have to assume uh, the truth of the allegations about Mr. Berlin, even though if we ever, if Mr. Berlin is forced to defend himself, he will, and it will be taken care of at that point. But this is a republication case, and a republication uh, in part, in from, part, in part, well, it's a tolling case. Well, fair enough. Uh, talking about 2017, it's a it's a republication case. Uh, and as far as 2017 goes, the law is that Erringer, who republished the, the, um, uh, the, the limited report, is absolutely liable for it, and he can be sued with no problem at all. You, you focused on that in your opening, and I just don't see how that gets you anywhere other than as a sort of fairness and equities argument. It's legally irrelevant whether Mr. Chandler chose not to sue Mr. Erringer. Well, it's it's certainly relevant when we get to the tolling, Your Honor, and, and I'll I'll put that aside. For, and the inquiry for, notice, okay, but right. but, 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 but I'm just not I, I'm not sure that you're using your time in the most relevant way by focusing well, on that. I, I mean, I had I, I had uh, pretty much used all the time that I was going to use on that point because the foreseeability argument with respect to um, uh, 2017. There's a fundamental difference uh, between the parties here as to what the actual standard is. Uh, we say that the standard is 
the very republication that is the source of the plaintiff's defamation claim must have been reasonably foreseeable to the defendant. How, uh, how much, because I thought you were pulling away from that after uh, Mr. Oliveri's brief said it can't be that it's, you know, this particular publication in this particular place in these, this particular <laughs> time, it can't be that narrow and the case law doesn't so suggest. So the question whether somewhere far down the road, this false information that is quite defamatory will see the light of day. Uh, yeah, it's relevant that it's far down the road, but, but does it have to be, you know, in Britain at, as of the time of the Brexit controversy? Oh, no, absolutely not. I, I, you know, I mean, if you have- You a, said the I, very republication at issue would, would have to be for, foreseen. Would, would, have, would have to be reasonably foreseeable, but mm -hmm. reasonably is an important qualifier in that, and we, and we uh, uh, certainly don't dispute that at all. In other words, the question is, Looking in 2003, and we don't deny that 2003 is the time when you look at this, looking in 2003, can you envision circumstances in which this report will be republished? And sure, I mean, we, we don't expect him to sit down there and, and, and say, yes, in, in Britain in 2017, there'll be something called Brexit and ask him, do you foresee that? The answer is obviously going to be no. But the point is this, the case law all says that the republication must be reasonably foreseeable. Mr. Chandler's position is if there's any, it's the ticking time bomb position. If any republication at all is foreseeable, then any republication is foreseeable. And that, that can't be the law. Because that is, well, because number one, the cases don't say so. The cases say the very republication. No, they must, don't. Well, Operago What's your said, best case for the very republication? Well, all the cases, I'd say Operago, Ingber, and Tavlarius. Um, Tavlarius says such republication. Uh, Ingber and Operag will say the repetition or the republication, and the restatement says that as well. And that definite article means something. What it means is, what are the circumstances? I mean, let's, let me uh, say this so there's no um, uh, uh, confusion here. I mean, in their reply brief, the standard that they offer from Psychiatric Institute of Washington is you don't have to foresee the precise injury. But what you do have to look at is, is the possibility of harm clear to the ordinary prudent eye? And we'll take that. We don't have a problem with that as a standard. So what's the question? The reasonable foreseeability question that we see is this. Was in 2003, was it clear to the ordinary prudent eye that this report given to one person and one person only, marked confidential, would somehow not be published by Erringer as a journalist, but be given by Erringer as a source to the press years later in a foreign country, in a country that has no relationship whatsoever to the events that are described in that report. And the only reason it goes to the press in that country is because what's in there is now newsworthy because of two events, Mr. Chandler's think tank and the Brexit controversy, that were totally unanticipated in that country years ago. You don't ago. think it could be anticipated that a well-to-do business person would be harmed by these kinds of claims in a report that Mr. Berlin wrote coming to light? Uh, it might be, but the point is not, is, is the harm to Mr. Uh, Chandler foreseeable. The question is, is the republication foreseeable? Mr. Chandler at that time has no connection to Great Britain at all. He's in right. New Zealand. So a republication, what if, what if what was foreseeable was that it would be published to media at some point down the road? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'd have to say that, that it depends on the, the, the nature of the foreseeability and the, the particular reason. Here, but isn't Mr. Berlin liable if it's, if it's given to anyone, including the prince? 
he, he only if it's reasonably foreseeable that it would and it wasn't to, it reasonably foreseeable that it would be given to the prince it's it's possible although not reasonably it, foreseeable well no because of the circumstance that he informed and this is undisputed he informed Erringer, look this is information that I've gotten from databases. You've got to go and you've got to verify this. You've got to check and see if it's correct before you rely on it. So I don't think that that's necessarily foreseeable, but even if it is, the fact of the matter is that giving it to the press uh, uh, many years later is not foreseeable, particularly because of their allegation that what this is, is a pitch. Now that's what they called it in the complaint. It's not a word that we, we've heard very much in, in, in this court, but that they have said is it's a business proposal. It's a confidential business proposal. It's a business proposal, which the very term pitch, I, I would think would work against the point you were just making, which is that perhaps the understanding was that Erringer was supposed to validate before he relied on, let's say in having the prince take action against Chandler, but as a pitch, as a teaser, it, was it not objectively reasonable to anticipate that Erringer would share it with the prince? Yeah, if in fact it was, and just to make clear, uh, we don't at all concede that it was a pitch, but we're assuming that for the purposes of, uh, of, of our motion. Uh, but it might have been foreseeable that it would go uh, to the prince, but it's certainly not foreseeable it's going to be published in the newspaper. If you're saying to the prince, I've got some really good information that you need to pay so that we can look into, you know, how much is he going to pay if he can pick up his newspaper and, and read it? And moreover, publication of it 14 years later at a time when Erringer is no longer working for the prince, at a time when Chandler is no longer living in Monaco. And when there is absolutely in 2003, no indication that anybody in Great Britain would care about this one way or another, takes it way beyond the, um, uh, the realm of reasonable foreseeability. Uh, timing is an important issue here as the cases that the district court uh, uh, cited uh, poll. The Gracie case from New York says three years uh, is, uh, is too much. H&B Associates says five years and so forth. The district court teed up the issue of, there's no case that ever talks about um, uh, reasonable foreseeability for this long a period. And the only case that they could come back with to uh, refute that is the Cosby case, which is a very, very different circumstance because in that case, the defamatory statement was intended to be released if those charges ever were made. Well, nine years later, uh, repeated, excuse me, nine years later, those charges were repeated. The statement was used for its intended purpose. That's light years away from this. Nobody suggests that giving this report to the press in Britain has anything to do with uh, encouraging Prince Albert to uh, pay more money for investigations. That's not gonna happen, no matter what. Um, the, uh, uh, the issue of Erringer's journalism hat. Erringer lost his journalism hat a long time before 2003. All of the information that they talk about, and by the way, the, the, their uh, counter statement of material facts, uh, rule seven of the, uh, of the district court's rules says, we as the movement put forth a statement of material facts and anything that they don't refute uh, is admitted. There's nothing at all about a counter statement of material facts and no obligation under the rules for us to respond to those facts. Uh, but putting that aside for the moment, Erringer's hat was off in the 1980s sometime. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Salon article, which of course was not a profile of Erringer the journalist, it was a profile of, of Erringer the spy trying to prevent publication of a book. Uh, and there are references to one magazine article that he wrote in the 80s, uh, a book or two that he wrote in the 80s, and some novels. There's nothing about that that suggests that he is a journalist, and he wasn't. He was an actual intelligence agent. He started working for the Prince in 2002, 
and worked for him uh, uh, through 2008. That's what his verified complaint says, which, by the way, was Mr. Chandler's exhibit on summary judgment. They put the whole complaint but, but in. But in terms of reasonably foreseeable, somebody who spent most of his professional life as a writer and is trying to launch into presumably more remunerative field, but that's a tenuous prospect. And presumably if he doesn't succeed or succeeds only temporarily, he'll be thrown back on his primary mode of earning a living, which is writing. And he could, isn't it foreseeable that he would then repurpose anything that might get broad public attention once that hat is, you know, just to take your formulation, once he's wearing his journalism hat again. Well, and, and then, so the, so the time lag might well be foreseeable in that, in that state of affairs and that he would use that information when and if he could to his advantage. I, I have two responses, Your Honor. One is uh, I, I would dispute the premise that Erringer spent most of his life as, as a journalist. If you look back in 2003, uh, Erringer had worked uh, for 10 years for the FBI doing counterintelligence, according to his book, which again is uh, uh, Mr. Chandler's exhibit on summary judgment. All of the journalism um, uh, references, and they are pretty sparse, refer to the 80s. Uh, and the early 80s at, at that, he wrote a book in nine, a book or two in 1980. He had been a novelist. He did some right. work. So it, it might be helpful to focus a little bit on the on the tolling argument. It seems like your argument for inquiry notice turns on references to we and to documents. Uh, I'm not sure I follow that, given that if if Erringer is having people, you know, stake out Sovereign Plaza or go down to the police station to get records. That could be a we. It doesn't suggest that there's any other kind of, you know, center of power uh, out there, um, nor does the existence of documents suggest anything other than perhaps public record documents. So, so am I wrong that, that you're position depends critically on those references to we and to documents alerting Mr. Chandler to the possibility of another actor? It, it depends, the, uh, the, for the Chappelle case, if we proceed, proceed under the Chappelle case, the primary um, uh, reference that we depend upon is the reference to documents. If we proceed under Fitzgerald, we don't need that at all. Uh, but as to Chappelle, what he says is, I have documents to support my charges. Well, you know, documents obviously don't create themselves. Somebody had to create those documents. Once Erringer says he has the documents, that imposes a duty to investigate. Diamond B. Davis says, you have a duty to investigate your affairs. And sure, Erringer says, I have documents. Maybe uh, they're public records. Maybe there's something else. But you can't sit back and rely on the maybes because under Chappelle, what you know is you know that uh, there are documents supporting Erringer's charges. Somebody created them. You have a cause of action against that somebody, and you got to find out who that somebody is. It's a duty to investigate. You can't just sit back and say, Maybe this, maybe that, maybe the other thing. More so do you investigate and to show that had he investigated, he would have found out? That's correct. That's correct. And for that, we, for that, Chappelle and Fitzgerald both say in the very narrow circumstance, uh, what we're dealing with here, which is, you know, you have a cause of action against one person. How does your knowledge of that cause of action against defendant number one influence your cause of action against defendant number two. And in that narrow circumstance, both Chappelle and Fitzgerald say, you've got to file the lawsuit. The cases that they rely on, Baskin and Locke, are, are both from other jurisdictions. And moreover, they are not defendant number one versus defendant number two cases. Judge Cassis, one... do you have any other questions? I just have one about how the two parts of the case fit together. 
So assume that the republication was, was reasonably foreseeable, which is unfavorable to you, right. but also assume, which is favorable to you, that uh, Chandler was on inquiry notice as to Berlin's conduct in 2003. Mm -hmm. Do you get an outright dismissal on those two assumptions or not? I um, I think we might. I guess the, the, the hesitancy that I that I would have is, I mean, the republication rule does say that if there's a reasonably foreseeable republication, you're, you're liable for it. The uh, complication here, I guess, is that he had an opportunity earlier on to sue for it. And he forfeited that opportunity, or yeah, he forfeited that opportunity by not doing so. And uh, whether- or could have had an opportunity had he, Investigated promptly. Had he investigated? Yes, he 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 for. I, well, he I guess he forfeited the opportunity to investigate, and therefore the statute of limitations ran. I, I'm what I'm struggling with, I guess, Judge Katz is, is I'm not sure, uh, just in the real world, how it would work out if he had sued earlier, and um, the statute of limitation had run. You know, after this. Uh, uh, whole case then were finished if someone then just went and republished it again. I'm not sure how those two would, would, would interact. I, I, I mean, the, I reason, would... the reason I ask is there are some cases that say, that seem to say the republication rule is a principle of damages. Um, and there are other cases that seem to say that a, a repub the mere republication mm -hmm. by a different party doesn't create a new cause of action. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the Gerasi case in New York uh, certainly seems to suggest that. Uh, I think that, and it may be that, that New York in certain instances doesn't follow uh, uh, every uh, uh, jot and tittle of the, uh, of the restatement. I think under the restatement, I think it's it's a principle of substantive law. That is, you are liable for a republication if that republication was reasonably foreseeable. Uh, my understanding of it is that it's a, uh, at least in the District of Columbia, which follows the restatement, that that's a principle of, of substantive law and not a principle of damages. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. Thank you, Jerry, we have uh, told you we would gift you back two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, to begin where Judge Katz has left off, uh, it would not be a full dismissal under DC law, uh, which follows the restatement as stated by this court in Jankovic. A republication is uh, a new publication which causes, uh, which gives rise to a new cause of action. So uh, it, I, thought, I thought Jankovic said exactly the opposite, which is that it's not a new cause of action. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, my, my understanding is that Jankovic uh, and the Fortic case all harken back to the restatement where uh, it says each communication of even the same defamatory matter, whether by the same defamer or uh, someone else, uh, gives rise to a separate and distinct publication, uh, which causes separate harm. Uh, if you have a separate publication and a separate harm, you could have a separate cause of action. <laughs> I wonder even if the original publisher had nothing to do with the republication. That, that's correct, as long as it was reasonably foreseeable that it would be republished. And, um, even, if, and even if a claim on the original publication would be time barred. That's absolutely right. I think that the situation that you see republication come up the most is where a claim based on an original publication is time barred. And then the question that's litigated is, is the subsequent publication a republication or just part and parcel of the first? Um, I want to mention Chappelle. Mr. Dean brought up the state of Chappelle. In that case, the court made clear 
that the plaintiff does not allege that defendant concealed the existence of a cause of action, just their identities, and the concealment of the defendant's identity uh, does not toll the statute of limitations. Here, we have the alleged concealment of the entire cause of action, the publication of the dossier uh, by defendants. It would be as if the uh, defendants in Chappelle concealed the car accident rather than just the defendant's identity. So I just want to make sure that we keep Chappelle and Fitzgerald uh, separate and distinct and aren't aren't conflating those two. Um, with regard to this, and you're saying this is not Chappelle because in Chappelle, it was known that there was an actor, it, just the identity of the actor was. was that's ab and here it's just not even clear there is an actor at all. Correct. And even more so in Chappelle, you knew that there was an injury, the decedent's death. <laughs> you knew the cause in fact, the car accident, and you knew evidence of wrongdoing, alleged negligent driving. You just didn't know the name of the driver. Here, <laughs> Mr. Chandler did not know of the publication of the dossier, the cause in fact of his injury, which was harm to reputation, or defendant's role in that, which is evidence of wrongdoing. <laughs> so now, what about Mr. Dean's effort to analogize this to Fitzgerald in the sense of like an employer-employee relationship versus a contractor contractee relationship? How really different is that? Why shouldn't we assimilate this to the military subordinates in <laughs> rather than the White House Independent Power Center? Sure. Uh, two reasons. One, in those cases, there was also the people who were responsible for the same harm. And even the district court acknowledged here, we're looking at two different harms, the harm from the original publication, and then the harm from the subsequent publication. But even more so, there's no evidence here that defendants and Erringer had any relationship whatsoever. In fact, defendants disclaim that. They say uh, in their declaration, the only work that they, they worked on together is that defendants contracted with, or Erringer contracted with defendants to publish or to put together this dossier. There's no ongoing relationship. They weren't members of the same group or same organization or same industry. You're looking at uh, people analogizing to the Air Force and the White House defendant, on the other hand, the only commonality that Mr. Erringer and defendant had was that they both conspired essentially to, uh, or both caused tortious harm to Mr. Chandler and the court in Fitzgerald and this court also in Hobson and Richards said, that's not enough. Otherwise, if simply being joint tort feasors or causing tortious harm to the same person were enough, then the Fitzgerald's claim would have accrued against the White House defendants. I'm, but, I'm a yeah. little curious, Mr. Oliveri, this is circling back to something we talked about earlier. You seem to see the disclaimer of the veracity of the information in the ICI report mm -hmm. as beneficial to you because it suggests, in your view, that the report would be shared with others in the course of verifying it. Mm -hmm. And you heard my question before, which was implying that no, you don't need to show the basis of your hypothesis in the course of verifying. In fact, it's often more effective not to. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not sure why Mr. Dean hasn't relied on it more, but if I give information, and maybe this is just a merits question, but if I give information to someone and say, I heard this, it may be completely false, but you know, here it is, you may want to follow up. How could I possibly be liable for defamation arising from that information? Well, two things, Your Honor. First, um, I think you're exactly right. This is a merits question. This is a fact question. Whether Which way does this disclaimer cut? I think it's reasonable. I certainly think my position is reasonable. Maybe Mr. Dean's position is as well. But that becomes a question for the fact finder. And second, um, I think your, your second question about liability would go to the specifics of the republication. If it were a situation where, or even if it were a situation where someone said, I heard this, I, I, think, I think this might be true, it may not. I think there's a closer call there than when someone republishes the material as fact to the British media. But there, that goes to the merits of the defamation claim, not the question of whether publication is reasonably foreseeable. There's an obvious publication element satisfaction there. The question becomes, is it defamatory as a matter of law? Was it published with the right element of fault? And those are just merits questions. Um, 
And one one last point, if I if I may, very quickly. Um, very the, quickly. The question of we uh, and my our investigation could very well have referred to Mr. Erringer and Prince Albert, our investigation, or uh, Mr. Erringer and his self-described Monaco Intelligence Service. Is certainly those are reasonable constructions, and I would submit even more reasonable, even though that's not the standard, than uh, defendant's involvement here. Or yeah. it seems to me even more effective for you, his administrative assistant or his research. Uh, that's absolutely aids. true. That's absolutely as true as well, Judge Pillard. And I thank you for uh, your time there. Thank you both. The case is submitted. Thank you, Your Honors. This honorable court is now adjourned until Thursday, December 10th, 2020 at 9.30 a.m. <laughs>